a ke haere tonu a tātou mahi. Uh, te kai kōrero tuatoru i tēnei ahi ahi. Uh, pediatric surgeon and urologist. Uh, he's a well-respected leader in the Cook Island community and Pacific Health sector here in Aotearoa. Uh, he was awarded a New, Ze uh, a New Zealand Order of Merit in 2014 for his dedication and indeed his commitment to Pacific Health. He is also joined by the CE, uh, Debbie Sorensen. Debbie is uncompromising in her commitment to improve the social and economic outcome outcomes of Pacific Island families and communities. Her forthright approach and willingness to say what she thinks may not always make her popular. I know a few of you like that in this room, but it's a, um, it's a price she's willing to pay to make a difference to those she serves. So please welcome Debbie Sorensen and Dr. Kiki Malte. In a mana e na reo, rauranga tēra mā, tēna koutou, tēna koutou, tēna tātou katoa. Talofa lava, nisa bolovanaka, kia rana. Whakalofa lahi atu, malo lalei. I stand here feeling very humbled to follow two amazing, or three amazing women, tells me the power of women. For my son, I bought one of the men that we work very hard, to make look fantastic and successful, <laughs> and really to demonstrate equity. <laughs> some of you may wonder how we got to be here, and indeed some days we wonder that too. I acknowledge Tariana Turia and her incredible generosity, her vision and her foresight, to recognise that our Fano. Our ayinga, our kai ayinga, were also in desperate need. That our outcomes, that our results, and our potential wasn't being reached. And I acknowledge her generosity, her humbleness, but her incredible encouragement for us to step forward. I have to confess that we were reluctant joiners. It didn't occur to us that we would be part of this conversation. We didn't even know what it was about when people came and approached us and when our community asked us to step forward and stand up. After talking to more than a thousand Pacific families from Kaitaia to Invercargill, they told us what was important. We didn't go to government agencies. We didn't look at all the data. We didn't read the New Zealand Herald or indeed TV1 News to tell us what our problems were. We live that every day. It's the context of our lives. What we heard from our families was what was important to them. We want to live longer and to be healthy and to run around after our grandchildren. We want to be there. No one once spoke to us about diabetes and can you fix it. We want education right through our lifetime, from our babies to our mamas. Mamas particularly wanted to be able to track their grandchildren through Facebook and Twitter and all of the other things. I think now they might be regretting it somewhat. <laughs> Certainly the grandchildren are. They wanted not to worry about the debt collectors turning them up and kicking them out of the houses. They didn't want to worry about the car being repossessed or having to pack up in the middle of the night. They wanted to be free from that worry and wanted to be secure in knowing that our children would be able to have a secure future, not worried by money, not worried about a financial future that was frightening and scary. They also told us that they wanted to be strong, that they wanted to preserve our culture, our age-old traditions, that those were the things that were important and would sustain our children. Hence our outcomes framework. That's where it came from. We now, as we stand here today, have 14,000 families engaged in the program. We have 75,000 Pacific people enrolled in Whanau Ora. It's 25% of our total population. More than anything else, this tells us that our communities support us, that they see something valuable, and that families have trust and faith in what's happening. All of this happened without any compulsion, without any thought of where we would get to. In fact, we were very, we, our aspirations were very small. We said we'd take 3,000 families if we could manage it in the beginning. Clearly, we're overachievers. <laughs> And we're reflected in our population, and again, this was a surprise to us. So all our communities, our 20-plus communities in New Zealand, 
are reflected in our program right across the board. Indeed, we were just talking today and we think that we have almost every Tuvalu person in the country engaged in the program. I don't know what those people are doing, but they've certainly got themselves all hooked up. So there is something that is appealing to our families. They are voting with their feet. No compulsion, no necessity, a desire to work with people who understand them in their context. We have more than 51 partners working with us, and we've demonstrated that families over these last five years have been able to achieve more than 35,000 positive wellbeing outcomes. And yet, in the context of this, we still have Crown Departments, we still have agencies who say, really? Do we really trust Fana Water? Do we really trust a commissioning agency? Do we really trust an approach? Well, if we're all about evidence, perhaps people might want to start examining the evidence because the evidence is there. Our families are talking. They have a voice. We've given them a voice. This is an indication of our data, and it's very interesting as we look at our domains. This is about financial security. There is no other program working with our families that is able to achieve this result. No other program at all. And yet we continue to invest in, can you please go and see the budget advisor for five sessions? And then that's done, you're done, you're fixed. And we continue to take that approach. We are saying here today we have a different approach. Families are telling us what works. We need to listen to families. And we need to look at the evidence. In this area, looking at early childhood education, we had been told when we started the program that 95% of Pacific children were enrolled in early childhood. And yet, if you live in my suburb, in Otahu, in South Auckland, we know this not to be true. You can't get your kids into early childhood. You can't get into quality childcare. And we know that that can't be the case. What we can see is that we've got kids now and we have families who understand the importance of having young people engaged in quality early childhood. We still have a challenge around having uh, culturally contextual early childhood programs and quality programs, but we're starting on that journey and the pathway, and the work that these families are doing to get their little babies into childcare early is incredible. Several cars, several uh, buses, people coming home from working all night, transporting their babies so that they get a really good start in their life. Ministry of Health, millions of dollars put into smoking cessation programs. This result isn't through any person going to a smoking cessation program. This is through a financial capability program where families have decided for themselves that they'll actually stop smoking because they understand how much it costs. Not because someone said smoking's bad for you and it's going to kill you. There's not one smoker alive who doesn't know that. So we need to think again about what we've traditionally invested in and think about new approaches. We think that in places like South Auckland, families have lots of access to cultural support. In places like Invercargill, they can't get anyone to teach their babies Samoan because it's a very small community. Needs are different for our communities all over the country. We can't assume any particular need. But what we know is we can't meet the growing demand, the cultural renaissance in our communities, the drive to preserve our language, the drive to preserve the very essence of who we are is struggling. We've demonstrated over the past couple of years that the families who tell us that they have lots of needs, very complex families, that they can make quite rapid change. This isn't necessarily a 10-year conversation. We had assumed it was, but they tell us it's not. They've told us, just give us a chance. In two years, we can make this level of difference. Again, we need to listen to our families and understand what they're telling us and have faith and trust in them. They actually know what's best. 90% of our high-needs families have made a difference in their lives over two years. It's an incredible impact, and we're all about impact. Again, here we see the numbers. So in our innovation programs, people who are reducing debt. I can't reduce debt in my household of 10 people by 5%. I need to enrol in the program. One of our stunning, stunning outcomes, working with Otahu College Desal One School with a very large Pacific population. When we started working in this school, they had no idea how many Pacific kids were doing science. So we've seen the change in participation, and that's all very well. So you've got kids enrolled in science and physics and chemistry. 
The most stunning information is this information. The kids in this school are actually leading national averages. We are driving the Pacific achievement in education. And yet I would say to education, why is Whanaora funding this activity when we have the evidence, when we have 10 years of evidence over a program? Why isn't this being integrated into large schools across the country? Why aren't we making a difference when we know what works? This is our opportunity. This is our opportunity to partner with you to really make a significant change if we just have the will. Most importantly, this is what our families say. And our families tell us this really makes a difference. For too long, we have delivered services, we have done things to people. People have been the objects of our benevolence. We have never once said, how have you found it? What do you think in any meaningful way? And so our families tell us this. More importantly, our workers, our navigators, people who do that everyday hard work, are very seldom asked, what is this like for you? And they tell us the most amazing things. Stories of redemption, of resilience, of deliverance. Stories of hope. We need to listen more to our families. We need to listen more to the people who are hands-on delivering services closest to where they matter. People who are working every day to support our ayinga, our whānau, our kāinga. At some stage, we really have to let the men speak. And so I guess that this is the opportunity. I noticed he was introduced before me, but as always, we let them have the last word. Dr. Mawati. Oh, uh, pretty daunting standing in front of all of you. Someone's going to be flash. Or maybe not so flash that we don't rely on each other. I think the predictions for us in the Pacific world is to take it and run. The data in front of you is our data. The data is cleaned by ourselves, Tipuni Kokiri, and everybody else who wants to look at it. We do not rely on other people to clean our data so that we're happy with it. That would be my message today. And then the next message on data is that at the national basis, we need to move the data so it's actually consistent with the outcomes that we want to get. To the other commissioning agencies, Merepeka, Helen, thank you for your acknowledgement. Michelle, if she's still in the audience, thank you for your uh, help with us. The Pacific world would not be here without the support of Te Puni Kokiri and Maridam. We are Tina Tuakana, we all understand that relationship. Mamataria Naturia, Tururua Flavo, and now Penny Hinari are staunch advocates of the Pacific world, and we're very grateful for that. They've put us on a platform now that we can actually contribute to New Zealand as much as we can to our full potentials. I stand here as a health professional. We have health professionals in our group. We have other senior management teams across the sector. We contribute to the economy. A week ago, I was in the operating theatre in Christchurch. That's the span of our skill set in this country. So we should be driving the agenda for all our kids, Pacific, Māori, and all ethnic groups, European in this country, to be able to be resourced and achieve their full potential. Because that's what Final Order is about. And we can all do this together. So without any further for me, I have to agree that we're, we've got lots of men here because Debbie and her team are 
teaching us how to be flash, <laughs> be smart, and to stand here and say hello, but in fact, they do all the work. So thank you very much. Kaki. Could I finish off where Helen started? Five of our um, families that we look after or that we walk alongside in Christchurch were involved in the shooting. One of them died, four of them are in hospital. Indeed, our chair, as he said, was in the theatre, sewing up children who had been shot. It is about all of us. It is about the care and the love that we have for everyone in our community. We are not the enemy. We are us. We're your partners, we're your colleagues, we're your brothers and your sisters. We're joined by kinship, we're joined by century-old histories and things that connect us. I thank you all for your generous and kind support to us. Michelle, thank you very much for your agency and the dignity and the respect with which they've treated us over the last six years. We have very much appreciated that. Minister, we thank you for your kindness and your staunch support to us. And we have long connections with you. And we thank you for your encouragement. We thank you all for the space today and for agreeing to share that with us. Maloa Pito.